much. Oh. They're oh, doing good. Yeah. Good, get them all here. I'll put it back where you have it. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather. If you saw our most recent garden tour, you know that we are racing against time before our frost comes. It's a going to be a hard freeze. It's not just going to be a light frost, which is really unfortunate. So I am a little bit worried I'm a lot worried about even our frost tolerant things that we have in the garden because it's been so warm this fall and winter is coming in so hard that there's essentially no acclimation time for these plants. And I think that if I don't take advantage of what they have to offer right now, that we unfortunately will miss out. So I am gonna be harvesting a lot of these greens today. We're gonna to be pressure canning them. It's really easy to freeze greens. And usually I like to do that in the springtime when I have our spring greens. The reason that I'm not putting greens in the freezer right now is it's fall and this is meat harvest time and so I need as much space in those freezers as I can get and so we're going to be canning these today. You can see here that our pak choy is flowering and a lot of times when a plant has decided that it's going to flower and put on seed the leaves become bitter and so I won't waste my time processing these plants if they are a little bit better so I'm going to give it a taste. They might be starting to get a little bit bitter, but it's absolutely palatable, especially in a dish with some seasoning. So we are gonna harvest these today. I don't want this flower stalk though. I'm just gonna snap off the flower stalks, break them up a little bit and throw them back into the bed. This will feed the soil over time. The way I've been harvesting my pak choy this fall is I haven't been pulling it up by the root. What I've been doing is twisting off the plant a couple inches before the base of the plant meets the soil. And the goal behind that was trying to see if I could get some of these plants to actually regrow more green so I can get more out of the one planting. Hopefully if we can get these stubs that I leave behind through the next couple days, we will get more green. So I'm gonna try. I am gonna try to cover what we don't harvest. But we're gonna get what we can out of these. Did you see that white moth? It's a cabbage looper or cabbage. I call them a white cabbage moth butterfly. It's not both a moth and a butterfly. I don't know why that always comes out of my mouth, but essentially that is the mother to the cabbage loopers, these little worms that like to eat our brassicas. Very likely she laid a couple eggs on that plant right there because we're getting such a hard freeze coming up. I'm not gonna worry about it. That freeze will take care of it. See that little thing? That's her egg right there. I guess we'll brush it off because we're here. Yeah, she's laid more. See there? She's laid a lot. Holy cow, look at them all. So this is what's left of our pak choy bed. This is an example of what I'm hoping happens if we can get the base of these plants through the freeze. You can see we've got another set of lovely greens coming on. This one's doing it too. I'm gonna do the same thing over here with the chard a little bit differently. So what I'm gonna do with these is just pinch off some of the bigger outer leaves. I'm gonna leave a few little tiny inner leaves. I think we'll be able to insulate the smaller leaves that are closer towards the ground better against the freeze than these big ones. We've got our big basket of greens. I did also pick some of the dinosaur kale. This looks like a lot, but it's gonna cook down quite a bit. Where well, are you? Molly's not living in here. You're in there. Hi, are you finding good things? Yeah. It's a good thing these are thornless blackberries, huh? Yeah. You wouldn't be in there if that was the case, if it was thorny. Yeah, it's probably getting too heavy. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. I'll put it over here, okay? That's so nice. That's a lot, it's good, thank you. Okay. 
So the recipe that I'm going to be using to can up my greens is a pressure canning recipe from the National Center of Home Food Preservation. So if you're not familiar with that website and you are brand new to canning, I would absolutely suggest that you click the link in the description. Familiar, familiarize, make yourself familiar with how to navigate the website, it's very helpful. There's a lot of very useful information on that website, not just for canning, but for freezing and drying. It's a wealth of information. We're gonna be using that information today. And in the recipe for pressure canning greens, it does ask us to remove the stems and ribs. And on this pak choy, you can see it's got a pretty hefty stem here. All I'm gonna be doing with these plants is grabbing the majority of the green and essentially like, unzipping the middle of the plant. See, I've got the greens here and this is what we're going to blanch. And these I can either break up and put back in the garden. You can feed the chickens, you can compost it, or you can put these in a bag in the freezer and use it the next time you make bone broth to add flavor and nutrition. The website also does suggest that you wash the greens. You can. I happen to know that we just got about three inches of rain and so Mother Nature has washed these for me. If I notice anything weird like those cabbage, moth, butterfly eggs that we saw in the garden, I will brush them off. I will run them under nice cool water. But in general, I'm not really worried about the cleanliness of these. And I'm also not going to worry about smaller ribs like this. The bigger stems, maybe, but even that is probably not too bad. This absolutely needs to come out though. All right, so we've got our greens here and this already looks like a lot less volume now that the stems are removed. Our next step is going to be to blanch these. So I've got a pot of water that I'm bringing to a boil. I'm gonna set this colander down in, give it a good stir, let these wilt down for a couple minutes and then we'll pack our jars. That is the same amount of greens. They wilt down very heavily, so I only have a few jars over here to pack. The recipe that we have says to pack them in loosely, so I don't wanna crunch down on them, but I am just gonna plop them in with the tongs. Here they are. And overall, we are gonna be looking for a half inch of headspace. So I have this little tool over here. This is called a headspace tool and debubbler. These are very valuable to have. And these little notches that you see here, each stair step is equivalent to a quarter inch. So if I set this tool here on the edge of the jar, on this little stair step, we have a quarter inch here and a half inch here. And as long as the food doesn't touch my tool, we're doing good, and it doesn't, I am gonna top this off with boiling water. And so I'm gonna bring my boiling water up to that point and we'll be at proper headspace. All those greens amounted to three pint jars. And they're not even as full as they could be. Again, I'm gonna be making up the headspace with boiling water. So it's kind of insane. <laughs> All right, so I've got water that just got finished boiling in my kettle. Topping these off. I'm gonna go a little bit higher than that half inch headspace and I'll show you why in just a second. You can add salt at this point and the salt measurements are on the website, on the recipe on the website. I'm gonna choose not to salt these today because I plan on adding these to recipes later. I don't want my end recipe to be over salted. So remember, I called this little tool here. It's not only the headspace tool, but it's also a debubbler. We can use this to remove excess air from the jar. You can see as I poke this down in, we're getting quite a lot of air that's coming out. And what that's doing when these bubbles are popping, our headspace is changing. The water level is going down. And that's one of the reasons that it's really important to debubble your jars before you can them so that you end up with the proper headspace at the end. If you have an incorrect headspace at the top, what that can do is it can just prevent a good seal. And of course, we've worked hard to grow this food and to preserve it. We want it to seal well. 
So once we've debubbled all we can, I will bring the water level back up to a half inch. It looks like it might be a quarter inch. I'll show you how I fix that. Oh no, we're at the half inch. We're good. All right, now we are set to put the lids on. And before we do that, I need to wipe off the rims of the jar. I like to use white vinegar to assist me in this. And the whole point of wiping off the rim of the jar is so that our lids that we place on have the cleanest surface possible in order to adhere to the glass. Little bits of salt or green can be on the jar. And we don't want that to be on there. So we're just going to wipe it off. Sometimes if I've had my lids stored in the cabinet, not in a box, I will wipe around on this seal here as well, just for good measure. And the lids that we use have a two part system. So we have our lid here, the te this is technically the lid part. And then this part is called the ring. And this is going to hold the lid in place during the canning process. What we're going to be achieving in the canning process is a vacuum. And in order to create a vacuum inside the jar, some of the air has to be allowed to escape. So we're going to be putting the ring on so that the lid will stick, but also we don't want it to be so tight that that air can't escape. If you don't give it a little bit of wiggle room, that air will escape by way of blowing the lid off of the jar inside the canner. It's not a fun cleanup process. It's not inherently dangerous. It's just a really big bummer to clean. So we're gonna be putting these rings on what's called fingertip tight. We have these three fingers here, and we're gonna be putting the ring on the jar as tight as we can with just these three fingers. just like that. So I did hold the jar and I did kind of wrench on it with just these three fingers, but that is not overly tight. So we'll be good to go. That's hot. That is hot to hold. These greens that we're going to be processing today are considered a low acid food. They're very low acid. We didn't even put any vinegar inside the jar. So in order to process them properly to be shelf stable in these jars here, I need to pressure can them. And with small batches like this, I only have these three pint jars. I don't like to pull my big canner down. You might be able to see it up there on my refrigerator. So I have this pressure cooker here that does have a canning feature and I'm gonna be using this today. Now, is this technically allowed according to the USDA? Not with this specific machine though. They haven't tested this specific machine. I'm comfortable using it. It does have a canning feature. I wouldn't use one of these machines without a canning feature. But if one of you does have the electric canner that has been tested and approved, let me know what you think of it because I really might be adding that to my arsenal. So inside, I've got the pot with a trivet here and I do need to add a little bit of water to the bottom of this pot. Because my jars are hot, I am adding hot water. I do not want to crack them. About two inches of water on the bottom. Yeah, that's good. Having the canning rack in here is very important because you can crack your jars if you don't have it, or if you smack them on your canner, you can crack them. So we're gonna be setting them in here just like so. Closing the lid down. And according to the website, we need to can these for 70 minutes for pints. So I have my canning button right here. Push canning. Increase our minutes. I know that looks weird on camera. It does not look weird like that in person. There we go. Hour and 10 minutes is 70 minutes. We're gonna click start. You can do a small batch like that in the big canner, like I mentioned, but I really like this for small batch canning. Another thing that I really like about this canner is I, I don't have to babysit it. So I can set it and I can comfortably walk away from it. This kind of thing, it, it has to be managed manually by me, increasing and decreasing the temperature on the stove so that the pressure stays pretty regulated. This has a system on the inside that regulates the pressure for me, so I don't have to worry about it. So we're gonna leave that to do its thing. I'm gonna go out to the garden and see if we have any more peppers. It's a little bit dark in my house right now, but I think you can see what's going on. These are all Sugar Rush peach peppers that I've set out to dry, so I'm gonna show you how I did that. So over here on this end of the garden is where we grew our Sugar Rush peach hot peppers this year. 
and we've picked a good bit of them off. I think I've gotten all of the truly ripe ones, all the orange ones. But these ones here, they're not quite ripe, and even the green ones, they do still pack a punch. I have seen and heard about people just taking the entire plant out of their garden and hanging the whole plant upside down so that the peppers can ripen. If you have done that, I would love to hear how well it worked for you. Oh, I see some orange ones. <laughs> they're hiding in here, look. Yep. at these. All right, so we'll get to drying those peppers in just a second, but I'm cooking dinner right now and I noticed that the pressure canner, it's, it says end, so it's done with the process, but we can't exactly just open the thing right now. This little red indicator here is letting us know that there is still pressure inside of here. So we want to wait until this indicator becomes flat with the top of the canner here so we know that it's safe to go on to our next step. And I do get a lot of questions about how we use the food that we grow. And I didn't film me making dinner tonight, but I can show you what we're gonna have. So fall time here is soup season, and I have made one of my favorites. This is Zappa Toscana. I will put the recipe in the description box so you can make it yourself. But we have pork from our own pigs, potatoes that we bought, broth, our milk is in here, and this kale is actually from my friend Elsie's garden. My spring kale in my own garden was kind of a flop, but my friend's kale was doing great, like well into June, it wasn't even bitter. And so she blessed us with some and I was able to freeze dry it. So this is, this is that right here, and it's rehydrated really great. And it has almost the same amount of nutrition as the day that it was picked, which is really cool. I did use freeze dried greens in here, as I mentioned, but this is something that I could have used like the fresh greens for honestly but these canned greens that are over here I could drain them and add them to a soup like this and that would work just as well all right so it's been a little bit we've eaten our dinner and this little valve is down so I in the past have opened up this vent here and just let it vent for around 10 minutes so that the outside air can kind of enter the chamber and help cool things down slowly. That's really not expressly necessary in order for it to be safe, both for us and for our food, to just go ahead and open the canner. Alrighty guys, so it's the next day and all of our greens jars have sealed properly. And the way that I can tell that is the top of this jar here, this lid is completely flat. When I press down on it, I'm not getting any kind of click. When the jars are not sealed or when you have one of these lids and it's not you know, attached to anything, you can flex it and hear the popping. But when it's sealed, there's no such popping. You can even hold the jar by the lid and it doesn't go anywhere. So if you think about that big basket that we had full of greens, divided into three. That's a lot of nutrition packed into the jar, and this is gonna be really useful later, especially if the freeze kills all of those plants. We're really gonna be glad that we did this. But let's move on to drying these peppers. So these are the ones we're gonna be stringing up and air drying. And this is the last of the sweet peppers that we were able to pick out of the garden. It's a really full bin here, and these we're gonna be freeze drying. So in order to create my pepper garland, I just have this cotton twine here. And this needle, this is a smaller type darning needle. You can use whatever needle, as long as it's decently thin, you wouldn't want something super thick. So what we're gonna be doing is threading this twine through the base of the cap of the pepper here. And this is where if you had too fat of a needle, you'd probably risk breaking this cap or the stem and that would defeat the purpose. So here's the pepper and our needle. I'm just gonna be poking through the base of the cap here. See that? I'm going to tie a knot in this just so it doesn't slide around. So we could make a horizontal garland like I did inside my house, or we can stack them vertically, which is what I think we're going to do today, which I think is more of a traditional way to hang them. That's really cool. So if you live in a place that's real humid, I have heard advice that you should pierce each pepper with a knife to increase the airflow. 
I'm a little bit suspicious of that because I feel like that could just introduce molds and bacteria, but do your research. It might be something that's necessary for you. It is pretty humid here, but inside our shed, we have a dehumidifier running, so I don't think, I don't think that's gonna be a problem for us. And our goal with these, when they are all dry, which should take about four to six weeks, is we're going to be crushing these up to make like a crushed, not red pepper, but a crushed, Peach pepper, I guess. Now we're gonna move on to freeze drying these sweet peppers. So in years past, before we got our freeze dryer, the way that I preserved my peppers was dicing them and putting them in the freezer in like gallon sized bags. I didn't blanch them or anything. You don't have to with peppers. And that worked really well. That's a very great way to preserve your peppers really quickly. I have seen people, you know, hollow out a bigger pepper like this and put in you know, cooked pepper filling, like for stuffed peppers and freeze them like that. And then you can put like a frozen stuffed pepper straight in the oven and cook it that way. It's a really great kind of fast food type option. We really like to make, I call it unstuffed peppers. So I'll just make like the pepper filling and then I'll just put in our frozen or freeze dried diced peppers and then we eat it with a spoon. So I am going to be dicing these with my really cool gadgets up here. This is a chopper that I bought from one of our local stores. This makes quick work of a lot of food when you have to do a lot of dicing. So let's get to it. See that lovely dice? That's what we're looking for. Oh, well, this is what we got. It's almost to the top of this pot and this pot fits about two and a half gallons in it to the tippy top. So we have over two gallons of diced peppers here. So now it's time to put them on the freeze dryer trays. So you hear the noise in the background that sounds kind of like a refrigerator. That's the freeze dryer. I have to pre-cool it for 15 minutes, which is the perfect amount of time that we need to load the trays. is that the freeze dryer is gonna do its thing now and it's probably gonna take about two days to finish the process. If we wanted it to take a little bit less time in the freeze dryer, we could have pre-frozen our trays, but that wouldn't have necessarily been less time for us overall. It just would have been a little less time with the freeze dryer running, but this doesn't cost more than your average refrigerator to run when it's on, so it's no big deal to me and I don't have something urgent that I need to put in there next. So we'll let it do its thing. And I do have some already <laughs> freeze dried peppers to show you so you can see the end result of what we did right here. So you might be able to hear they're nice and dry and crispy and they're incredibly light. Oh, it smells exactly like a green pepper as you'd expect. But I, I tell you, it's nearly just as light as air. Let me see if I can get this snap to come up on camera. Hear that? Crispy? It tastes a lot like a green pepper because it is, but there's almost, it's almost got a more concentrated flavor, which makes sense because there's no moisture in here. Freeze drying the peppers is going to help retain about 97% of their nutritional value for up to 25 years if stored properly. So stored this way isn't the way to really get that nutrition to last that full 25 years. We plan on using these within a year or two and storing them in a jar like this is perfectly fine. But for long-term storage, this is summer squash, we would be putting it in a Mylar bag. Inside this bag is an oxygen absorber and this really thick bag protects it from the light because light absolutely degrades nutrients. This kind of packaging is for long-term storage. In order to rehydrate the peppers, we'll just put whatever peppers we want either straight in the food that we're making. So here's an example. 
the unstuffed peppers that I talked about before. So when I cook the rice and I have my rice cooker going, what I would do is just add a little bit more broth or water than I would normally to cook the rice, add in these peppers in with the rice in the rice cooker and allow them to rehydrate right in there and cook along with the rice. And that's kind of like a no brainer way to do it. But let's say we wanted to use these peppers in something like an omelet. What we would do is just add a few peppers, however many we feel like we want into a jar, add a little bit of water, wait about five minutes kind of swirl it around and then they'll be perfectly great and ready to use now they don't rehydrate exactly like you know a fresh pepper it would be a lot like a thawed frozen pepper which works really well in a lot of applications to include omelets some of the more observant of you may have noticed these two jars on the counter so I have also started another batch of hot sauce and some more fermented cucumelons these are a lot like pickles I didn't show you the process of doing either one of these because I have videos on them and so if you're interested in seeing either one of these processes click one of these videos and I'll see you over there. Mm -hmm. 